A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. Well, actually, no, it was just last night, and it was on this table. That's right. <laughs> First, I'm going to show you something that's silly. See, this is the measuring tape we use when we are uh, playing the round-the-table uh -oh. type dealiness. There we go. It's the copyright Games Workshop own measuring tape. How about that one? So, well, they uh, can't copyright a tape measure, but... <laughs> yeah, but they've got the copyright symbol on the Aquila. That's and their logo, obviously. Games Workshop product. Just to make it a little bit extra lollable. So, how did you feel about Session 7, Laurie? Ah, it went all right. Yeah. Everyone was quite tired, I think, weren't they, really? Yeah, I guess. People had either in a combination come from work or uh, been sleep-deprived for whatever reason. Mm. I was up 5.30 in the morning. Not of my own choice, I might add, but hey... Such is life sometimes, eh? One of our players was suggesting that the usage of the shotgun may want reviewing in some way towards whether it can miss in quite the same way. It was argued that, you know, the shotgun, even when it misses effectively, that it wouldn't really be missing. There'd be some degree of hit anyway. You weren't comfortable with that suggestion, were no, you? No, because to, the whole to house roll. Well, the whole point of the you roll the dice, you hit or you miss thing is like, you either hit or you don't. It made you a bit nervous, the idea of... Yeah, if I start going like, oh, you've missed, but you still do damage, then we're pretty much taken to the point of what we did with Pete's hammer. Yes, some of you might remember the atrocity of a situation that occurred <laughs> there on that mission with that damned hammer. Yeah. Yeah, and it's explosive radius effect thing. Yeah. yeah that... However, the fact is, a shotgun has this scatter roll, and the scatter roll can be found on page 100. 29 of the weapon qualities of the core rulebook when firing at an opponent at point-blank range every two degrees of success 20 points below your ballistic skill of whatever your new ballistic skill ratio would be because point-blank range you get plus 30 and there's other modifiers that might add to it for example like aiming or aiming 10% uh, or, or plus 20% or full auto wing or semi auto wing or whatever if a shotgun can do that some because, shotguns can as we have found with certain yeah once, it um, hits an extra target for every two degrees. If you really want to get the most out of them, get into what the game effectively calls point blank. Now, now, session 7 has seen us taking part in the modules of a new book called The Black Sepulchre, so should we take a look at that? Uh, this is it, and we played Adventure 1 of 4 that are contained therein. This one called Death From Above. So we dropped in... Quite literally. <laughs> Straight into a cathedral, pews either side of us. There were certainly a lot more pew pews pews when we took cover and got our guns yeah. out. <laughs> we were firing at a bunch of troops and a servitor who we came to call <laughs> Metal Mickey. <laughs> we always name these people, don't we? Yes, Stompy yes. dude, <laughs> Mr. Stompy, and, and it wasn't just Metal any Mickey. servitor, gun servitor with a built in Harry Bolter. This thing only fires in full auto. I mean, we had like 20 odd ballistic, ballistic skill. <laughs> yeah, what is with that? The, I don't know. The enemies really weren't able to hit us. I mean, we took cover. We had a shootout. Straight in, we won. As you do. Nobody died. Did that make you happy, that battle? Mm, no. Why? As a GM, no, but the book says this is meant to be the easy part. So, I can't really complain. It just seemed too easy. It is part one of the Apostasy Gambit, a free book trilogy. The first two books are out. And I also have the second book, but I probably won't run that for a while. And the third book won't be out till some point next year. Now, the point here is, it suggests minimum of rank 3 before you start playing this. However, it also gives recommendations on how to scale certain encounters. Not just combat encounters, but also social encounters. By making difficulty t tests harder for the players. It suggests things for having more than four players, having players of rank 5 or above, having players that are in Sension rank as well, mm. of how to up it. Like, at one point, that gun servitor, originally it's meant to only have an auto gun, but because my players are rank 5, right. it suggested that I add a heavy bolter onto it. However, it also said if you guys are like rank, having like 6 players or something, or even Ascension... Give it a frickin' plasma gun. Okay. <laughs> Instead. That was like one option to give it. It mm. says in the book for the GM to do. Okay. And it does that with just about most of the things. The entirety of this trilogy 
is meant to be for any rank. Do you think you'll be implementing that idea? A lot? I have been using it, and okay. that's pretty much the idea. However, the fact is that thing couldn't hit for shit. This section, this first mission, it's meant to make the PCs feel powerful. From a GM's perspective, that doesn't really make me feel all that great. <laughs> no, it wouldn't, would it? No. It True. should always be life or death. True. Unfortunately, it's just usually death for the enemy. I have um, done some pre-reading, of course, obviously, of all these chapters before I actually officially read every bit. To be quite honest, from what I'm seeing is, it won't be until we get to the latter half of the book will anyone be in any real danger, from what I can say. I'm going to challenge you with something, Laurie, okay? We'll put it out there and it will be a good source of discussion, I'm sure, in the comments as well as the video goes on. You didn't really feel the, the fear on that. No. But obviously the, you could have took what the book said as just a suggestion and done things any way you wanted, really. Yeah. I personally thought they just feel like drones. They're mooks, essentially, aren't they? They but were meant to be from the way they were They're meant to be, meant but... I find that they're just shooting back at us and we're shooting at them and we're doing all these things like taking cover and thinking tactically um, and fighting in that manner and they're getting slaughtered. I'm going to challenge you with something. Yeah. What if they had have acted as more of a cohesive squad type unit? They weren't meant to be. That's Why? the issue because Why? they're just stupid grunts, if you will. Soldiers, though. For a noble house, they're not really trained for... Guardsman duty type battle, if you know what I mean, Imperial Guard style. Right. Yeah. It's, Especially it's... with their stats mostly being in the 20s. Yes, that's the awkward thing, isn't it? And it's, it's like, oh, then you've got, if you want to take it even further, you've got to up their stats type stupidness and actually right. give them, them experience built in, on top of adding more to the combat that the book suggests. How would you feel about the idea of, in some cases, having... The enemies do things like aims and other combat actions rather well, than just the straight firing. Like, well, considering what? most of the time they are doing that, but the problem here is are on they? top of... Yeah. They're aiming? Yeah. You're taking that into account like a plus 10 and then shot? Yeah. Okay. Another point is... And they're still missing like crap. Yeah, well, they've only got like 20-odd, and I'm rolling freaking 90s and 70s. <laughs> I remember Caractacus the Cleric ran at him. Uh-huh. Went for him. Yep. What if he'd have said thought to himself, right, I perceive threat of Caractacus mm -hmm. coming at me with a great big glowing hammer. Suppressive fire. It's can't suppressive fire on your enemy's turn. No. That and you can't really suppress when someone's charged you and you can't fire in close combat. Again, it's that issue, and I've been going on about this, this issue of landing in and being within charge range in the first turn. If the NPCs were utilising perhaps more things like like mm -hmm. we say, it's suppressing fire. Yeah. They might pin that person down because we're not. Not every encounter is going to be instant charge range, or it shouldn't be. What if you pin down a key melee personnel? Well, the problem here is with a suppressive fire, and so that they that so that the friendlies can move up, flank us perhaps, shoot at us, so we don't get our cover saved. That's been saving our asses. What well, if one of those troops that have grenaded our position and forced us to scatter, and then we're around of getting shot at? Well, Without the fact cover. is, you guys are smart enough and they didn't have any grenades. Okay, well, you know, if they had, of, for instance, obviously it's about utilisation. But, I mean, yeah. in general thinking, I feel <laughs> that the NPCs need to be a bit more thoughtful about what they... If they are militarily trained, for example... Yeah, in this case, they possibly not, Possibly really. use suppressive fire, actual charges with plus 10% weapon skill if you hadn't been doing that. That's, um, of course, if they're actually melee built. If it's a well. melee charge... But just thinking tactically, thinking like they're, they're shooting and moving and they're creating openings so that they, others can flank. And, yeah. you know, very very much like flanking positions, which is what modern military engagements are about, um, suppressing and flanking, really, aren't they? Pretty in, much. In war zones. So, um, well, well, the problem is, you're not meant to have trouble at this point. That's that's how they build it. You're not yeah. meant to have no, trouble. I'm, you're I meant mean, to win easy. I mean, generally for... And that's what pisses me off. We haven't had that seven sessions in from any mobs so far, from any en enemies. Well, most of the m mobs or enemies have not been really in large groups of military built yeah. style, which is a piss take, really. Which is why when I decide to bring in my own pre-written stuff of my own work, mm -hmm. it'll, you'll find it a lot harder because you'll be facing things that are more your level, and yeah. probably more higher than you because of their stats. Well, like I say, you can always adjust what you don't like. Well, the problem is with modules, you're not allowed to adjust to a point. That's the issue, isn't it? 
They're saying if you start adjusting it beyond the recommendations that we've given you, you're going to f*** the game up and make it unbelievable. Well, it says for rank 3 up, right? And we're rank 5. Yeah, it gives suggestions of what you can do at rank 5. And you followed all of those? Mm-hmm. Increase the amount of mobs, improve the weapon that the guy gets, you know, that stuff. See, maybe he could have been a bit more outgoing with that weapon. For instance, maybe he could have pulled something like, I don't know, shot at the roof and made clumps of it fall down on us. Yeah, they wouldn't let that do that. It's programmed to attack only you. It's not... It doesn't have a high intelligence. So it wasn't being... It wasn't it's giving... a servitor. Servitors are dumb. Yeah, but it wasn't giving orders on like a, a camera uplink and micro bead feedback. No, it's just got an internal vox for receiving orders. It's set to... Kill any intruders. So it's just running on pre-programmed. Pretty much. Again, you see. You see. But this is ways that it could be better, I think. And as long as you carry that idea in you, I'm, I'm sure you'll be able to start utilising something where it allows you. Even if you feel restricted now. The idea of... Yeah, well, I've got a bad problem that most of this stuff's going to restrict me anyway. But that's the thing with modules. They like to restrict you. I also want to cover this too. Mm -hmm. At one point in there, we had a door... And I came to the door, I was mm -hmm. on, I decided to take point, and I just thought to myself, it's going to be rigged to blow, it's going to have a booby trap on it, it's yep. probably going to have some explosive. Yep. But I was like, yep, opening the door with my gun, let's yep. go, and it went boom, and I jumped the hell out of the way and I took no damage. Now, yep. here's the thing, everyone looked at me and said, why didn't you check, and it's like, yeah, I can't be asked. And this is the thing. My guy is focused on demolitions, right? There's a booby trap on a door, and I've not bothered with it. Why? I'll tell you why. Because I'm rank 5, and I get demolition at rank 6. Exactly. In Freeblade, I believe it is, the demolition. If I go that path, I'll, um... Yeah, okay. because at this point, you're rank 5. If you right, When you get to rank 6, you now have the option to go between two separate paths. Yes, yeah, so there's sort of a ranged one or a melee one. I'm going to go the ranged one, the free blade route. I didn't have the demolition training, so I can't even attempt to disarm explosives, really. Yeah. Um, it's kind of bullshittiness. So I thought, let's just get on with it. Let's let the thing try and blow up, and let's use my skill at getting the hell away from it. And of course, I was proven right on that. But still, everything I ever want to do in all these missions... I never quite have the right skill for yet because it's always in the rank or two to come. And then I get the things yeah. as a skill and then I don't get to use the bastards yet. Mm -hmm. I'm plus 20 on pilot civilian craft and I haven't been able to pilot squat all. I'll probably get demolitions now and probably find no need for it anymore. Hey, that's what GM written stuff is for, to make players use their skills. That's another point. It's all this. It's like, let's have a rogue in D&D &D so we can unlock all the tr locks and pick all the traps and all that nonsense and... The GM's like, oh, I'm not using traps. You're wasting skill points. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. It shouldn't really be a case of, oh, the GM's not using them. It should be a case of, well, you've found a particular place in the world that happens to have traps. It doesn't mean that everything will ever always have to use traps. But if yeah. you are allowing for the realms of not not realism, but believability there's in your world, then there's going to be traps in the world somewhere. Even if you are a GM who doesn't run traps, tough, there are traps in your world. <laughs> but You'll have to put some, at least sometimes, even if it's 1% out of a 1,000. Yeah, it's the, the argument is that it's like, oh, there's a trap here, we're in a dungeon, there's a trap. Oh, we're in... And uh, we're in a castle, there's a trap. Oh, yeah. we're in a crypt, there's a trap. It could go the other way, couldn't it? You don't want it to go the other way. Either. We're oh, okay. in a forest, there's a trap. Okay, where's the other traps? Where's the other traps? Oh, I'm going to try and get in the bed. I'm going to check the bed sheets. I'm trap checking. Trap checking everywhere. I'm going to pour my cereal. Trap checking. Is there a bomb underneath? <laughs> Cautious versus paranoia. You mentioned caution versus paranoia, and you said, look, this group's getting too paranoid for their own good. Yeah, you, you say we're following false leads and you basically inform us. It's like, look, you're, you're trying to follow a red herring that isn't even there. Even though that probably sentence I just said makes no sense. <laughs> the, guy, the guys feel this way too. And that is, that is that we know that realistically these situations are deadly. They are supposed to be life-threatening. Yeah. But also, it's not just our characters at stake. We've got to think like it was our own lives. Because if you're not portraying it in that way, that sense of like that sense of danger yeah. that you might actually die, then you're not really... It's more of a case of putting it up. But furthermore, then, remember who we work for. 
Mm. We aren't just an adventuring band. We work for the bloody Inquisition. We find heretics all day, all night. That's all we do for a living. We're going to be paranoid. We're going to see the worst in people. We're going to expect the worst in people. We're going to say, okay, who's the mole? Okay, who's the mutant? Okay, who's the betrayer here? Is that, well, there isn't a betrayer. This isn't even where the mission is. This is where we're handing the mission. Yeah, there's going to be a betrayer here too. We work for the Inquisition. That's what we do. We look. We look for signs of heresy, darkness. It's, the job gets to you after a while. <laughs> I think that's. I think some some of that paranoia is justified. We're looking. Well, there's always paranoia, to... and then there's actually expecting the worst. In the case of the Inquisition, you trust people to a degree, but you trust them to be guilty of something. We we'll call it Malvanius syndrome. The job gets to you. There we go. After, after enough. <laughs> I don't like you. Why? <laughs> Because you're the sort of person who says why when I say I don't like you. <laughs> You've just proven it. <laughs> I don't know. Yes, that's the Malvanius one, all right. <laughs> we all know that our arbitrator, Padraig, he don't like psychers, does he? Nope, he don't. He don't like them. No. He, he hates them. He's they got... all make him go a little bit um, weird in the head. <laughs> yes, he gets a little psycho around them. Now, there was a particular psycho... And he'd been rendered unconscious, I believe, at this point. Oh, yeah. Pate had basically taken his officer's cutlass, which is a shocking weapon, and smacked the guy in the chest. He's lying there on the floor, and Pete is putting the boot in. He's kicking him in the head. <laughs> yeah. He's kicking him in the head, and then he started kicking him in the testicles. <laughs> I was like, all right, Pete. <laughs> now, at this point, it was like... Okay, shouldn't we give him a corruption point, really? He's, he's willingly wanting to do this. I mean, hell, we have to give the player a corruption point. <laughs> and we were like, look, I'll give you a warning, and he did the, the test, and he wasn't getting it, and then he wouldn't stop still torturing this psycho. I was like, him. Pete, I'm giving you a D10 now. <laughs> he rolled a D10, you got a 6, he got 6 corruption. He now has 14. He's at his first stage of tests, people. <laughs> he failed and ended up taking his first malignancy test. You take a malignancy test every 10, and you take a mutation test every 30. And he rolled a blackout. We laughed at this because the player himself suffers from blackouts. <laughs> the person himself suffers from blackouts of occasion. We don't know what causes them, but he has them. And now his character has blackouts, and we've laughed at this before. Character creation coincidences where just from the roll of a die, they end up with something like us. Or something and we want them to, right? Something about this little group where that <laughs> keeps happening. It's like the longer we play them, the more and more the character slowly <laughs> becomes us. And it's the dice doing it. It's not even us. But the, the way these blackouts work is it's supposed to be a GM tool. You decide, mm -hmm. don't you, it as and where. When it happens, what he sees during this blackout, if anything, and what may happen. Heck, I, he could basically... Black out due to a combat situation, be the last one standing. For some reason whatsoever, time could have passed and he doesn't know what the hell just happened. You've got a lot to play with there. I mean, he could end up in the presence of a psycho that pisses him off so much, he will black out and basically still being active, but doesn't know what the hell just happened. This could be quite scary. <laughs> I got a cloak out of the thing. Xeno crafted, made from some sort of beast unknown. Mm. I would guess it's probably something like an Eldar Ranger's combat cloak or something I would guess or something like that or maybe me being the way I, well my assassin being the way he is he will have handed that into the inquisition and they would have passed it clear and said well yes you can have it back then and uh, we do not <laughs> consider it to be a high enough threat there were a to variety of I, there was a variety of items here that were picked up at now, the end of I the took mission. that now the interesting thing for me was you know he's nimble he's got to be quick and so he's got this kind of slight suit on that's a bit like Crisis Guy, you know, in those games he looks a bit like that. Mm. But maybe not as powerful as that even, obviously, because there's only three across the board. How to really add to that? Well, you can't do too much. You'll lose his agility, which you're trying to RP towards anyway. Yeah. And so a cloak, I thought, was a really decent way of doing it. Just whack a cloak on him. He can still flow on his arms and body. He now has five armor and the rest is... Is three. You just pick the highest one, they don't stack. It was a good quality version, so instead of it being the four the book gives, it gave him five instead. Yeah, and he got past to, to, to use that now, so, mm -hmm. you know, he's he's going to be able to bat think, I guess. And... <laughs> yes. <laughs> there was also a variety of other items in this section, such as a long raz, I should say, 
pretty much a sniper rifle las gun, if you will. <laughs> I had that too. Yeah, you had my, that. It's in my locker room, no doubt, <laughs> yeah. Um, there was also a the best quality bolt pistol uh, that um, Karakticus picked up, which he later gave to Padraig. They did a swap. Yeah. Padraig picked up Karakticus some carapace armour. I think it was, yeah, Stormtrooper carapace armour, or something of the equivalent to that. Pretty much Guardsman, if you will. Which cost a hell of a lot of money. Karakticus didn't have it, but... Padraig, being the nobleborn, gets 500 plus his rank increments a month. Pete gave him that. It was like they did a swap for it. Mm. So now Pete has himself a nice bolt pistol. Best craft, best quality craftsmanship too. Also on this front, I'm going to mention repeat here, is his new way of acquiring items, if you will. <laughs> Some of the items in here were questionable. Padraig got himself a good quality Xeno sword from this area, and the only way I'm going to get away with using it is by saying, taking that as evidence, <laughs> even though I'm actually going to use it. <laughs> yeah. Evidence! No, it's evidence. And the other thing is, he's so hot on the scum stealing things all the time, he's even pre-rolling, he's rolling dice in advance before <laughs> before Kistine's even tried to do anything. He's on top like, of that... He rolls it successfully, a spot check, and he's like, yep, yeah, but don't even bother before you even try, I've just rolled a 14. <laughs> Another thing is, whenever I mention there's X amount of money on the corpses, because things like, no, it's not. Our cleric has become a paladin, effectively. Yes, in his heavy armour, pretty much. His and character. hammers, and hammer. Yes, retry paladin. <laughs> and big glowing demon smiting hammer as well. <laughs> Jokes and now and he ha has healing, Medicaid. <laughs> yes, he does have healing, he's took Medicaid. So I was like, oh my god, it now. he's now a true paladin. Apart from paladin, no heals only work on themselves. <laughs> it's the running joke. <laughs> Our arbitrator has swift attack. <laughs> yep. He can hit twice <laughs> in a single combat round for a full action. So he basically had himself a chain sword, because he's taken web melee weapon training chain, and has gone two attacks with that throughout the entirety of things, and just basically torn things to shreds, literally. With my upgrades, I went for the plus five toughness, which brought my toughness from 30 to 35, which isn't a lot I know, but think about the next one, I'm going to have toughness... 40, and then that's my toughness bonus yep. up one, which means I negate one extra wound constantly. I Everyone's made. taking a couple of plus fives here and there. Mm. And I've also got the the next uh, plus to dodge, so I'm now plus 20% to dodge, mm -hmm. which is plus 20% onto my agility. Which was really lot worthy for the beginning of Death From Above, where you were having like oh, a plus 50 because of that. Well, that's it. We've updated you on Session 7, and remember... Have faith in mankind, and have faith in the Emperor. Well, if you can't do that, join and become the Xenos and kill mankind. That's what you can do in 40k, even though you can't do it in heresy. <laughs> Just generally. You can become a heretic or something. Oh, yeah. At the way Pete's going, he probably is. <laughs> but whatever happens to us, I don't know what will happen. We'll find out together, won't we? And whatever happens to you in your campaigns, as always... I'll see you at the table. And he ended up getting a... His first, first malignant... <clears throat> Here's a fun thing that happened. Oh, wait for that, because of continuity. Because it will go like that and yep. just suddenly disappear. <laughs> <laughs> good. <laughs> yeah, that'd be a good Otaku note. Oh no! Live editing! <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> 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 <laughs>